There comes a time in every parent's life when their child inevitably asks why they have to go to school. My answers have ranged anywhere from because I don't want to go to jail to so you can get a good job and take care of daddy when he's older. Regardless of your answer, I'm willing to bet you didn't know that children weren't allowed in the first schools. That's because schools weren't invented for learning, they're invented for unlearning. You see, the entire ancient world knew that the more you fill your head with knowledge, the farther you are from reality. Wisdom isn't attained, it's allowed. And it doesn't come from teaching, it comes when the teacher gets out of the way. This model, which didn't have any homework or tests, produced some of the greatest minds our world has ever known, along with breathtaking art, music, and architecture. Today, kids have to go to school, and all our buildings look like rectangles. And illiteracy rates have skyrocketed. The answer to why, like all things, is found in story. 200 years ago, 80% of men and 50% of women could read and write without ever going to school. We were so proud of this that newspapers openly bragged that America had higher reading and writing levels than any other country. And these literacy levels crossed all cultural barriers. By 1880, 40% of Southern Blacks could read and write, and in 1910, 70% of the African American community could read. And when children did eventually go to school, every single boy and girl could read before their first day of class. Let's recap. High literacy rates, low literacy rates. And the people here that can read can't really understand what these people read. You don't believe me? Just try to read the Federalist Papers or Plotinus. And you'll never meet someone that can read and understand this book. So what happened? The Department of Education was invented. Not that long ago, people would have thought you were crazy to even suggest that the government should have a hand in teaching your child. Especially when the system was working so well. You can't fix something unless it's broken, and that's where Horace Mann comes in. Parents that are just waking up to the fact that they have no voice in their child's education have him to thank for it. He practically single-handedly installed the historically catastrophic Prussian model our public schools are based on. He was openly hostile to parents and believed only the state should have control over a child's welfare. Before man's totalitarian doctrine took hold, America had one of the best education systems the world had ever seen. Now, the government has full control, and American education is a failure by every performance metric. We spend more money on education than anyone, and yet our test scores are repeatedly below the global average. And it's said, we have the worst educated workforce in the industrialized world. The good news, if there's any, is that parents are slowly waking up, which is why the number of homeschooled children increases every year. But all that means is that we're returning to our roots. Remember, our founding fathers were homeschooled. Now, it's important to point out that this isn't a criticism of teachers, just the system they're trapped in. I personally know two that are some of the most intelligent and inspiring people I've ever met. And I know firsthand how difficult the job can be. But ask yourself why one of these groups is vilified and the other venerated, despite the fact they are far more dangerous to a child's welfare. And the answer, of course, is that it's not about education, it's about control. The entire point of the curtain model is to get you into the rat race, not so you can make money, but so you can make money for someone else. The people here don't receive the same education as the people here, if they receive one at all. There's a reason the richest people on earth don't have college degrees. And you can't get here by working hard. The only way out is to stop playing the game. Success in a broken system means you're broken. I know this firsthand. As someone with multiple degrees who graduated summa cum laude, believe me when I tell you that here, all laurels are shackles. As the saying goes, no one will ever give you the education required to overthrow them. But this wasn't always the case. In the first schools, teachers didn't impart wisdom, but instead drew it out of their students through retroduction. The focus and memorization of facts would have been considered profane because the entire point of education was to disagree with your teacher. We see this played out historically in the relationships between Plato, Aristotle, and Alexander the Great, who eventually set up a school in India that completely contradicted everything his mentor taught him. And this was a good thing. If you think what your teacher thinks, then education hasn't occurred. Over time, even Plato's academy fell prey to his pedigree, which is why Plotinus left in disgust. Memorizing the thoughts of a thinker doesn't make you one. Today, school is all about memorization, but memorization isn't education, it's indoctrination. Teaching kids what to think is the opposite of teaching them how to think. 
Children instinctively know the emperor isn't wearing any clothes, which is why we send them to school, to indoctrinate them into believing he is. The goal is always the expansion of a political worldview. This is why we no longer teach the logical fallacies or even the Declaration of Independence. We pretend we do, but not really. Why? Because we don't want kids to see that the entire system is based on logical fallacies. And the Declaration of Independence shows kids that not only are we not a democracy, we're not even a constitutional republic. Our form of government is rebellion. The Stoics were one of the first groups to put this into practice, but it was the Jesuits who perfected it. The truth is, there's no such thing as adults or children. There's only the programmed and the unprogrammed. You see, the subconscious doesn't age. Sure, our bodies and minds grow, but none of us actually mature. Once a wound occurs, it becomes the program or lens through which we experience reality. This is why we say you can't teach an old dog new tricks and why two people can witness the same event and walk away with a completely different experience. It's also why the hero in every story starts as an orphan and the lesson they learn is that everything they know is wrong because none of us are living in reality. Let's look at two examples. Most of us spend our lives worrying about time, but time only exists as a measurement and every creature on Earth measures it differently, including our pets. Dogs experience time 33% slower than humans, and when we speak to them, they hear us like we're talking in slow motion. So, which species is correct? Are they slow, or are we fast? It depends on who's making the measurement. The same is true of color. Color plays an important part in our lives, but color isn't a property an object has or possesses. It's a result of how light and objects interact, meaning, despite what it looks like, an orange isn't really orange. Keep this in mind the next time a politician tries to divide you. It's just another example of how we have to look past the facts to find the truth, which is why schools were invented, so we could unlearn everything we have learned. We'd all like to believe that we receive sensory input and then use logic and reason to arrive at our conclusions, but that just isn't the case, even for scientists. Our senses exist to filter reality. Every second, we're inundated with millions of pieces of data, which is then filtered through our programming, leaving us with only a few options to choose from. That's why we say you have to pay attention. There's always a cost. Anytime you focus on something, you miss out on reality. It's also why it's said that the universe and God provide evidence for every theory imposed upon them. All perception is projection and schools were invented to alter perception. Now, they exist to enforce it. This is a good time to go over the difference between facts and truth. And no, they're not the same thing. There's only one story because there's only one cycle. There's only one cycle because there's only one field, and there's only one field because there's only one dimension. Now, if you've been educated in the last 100 years, warning lights are going off and you're saying, no, hold on, that can't be true because I have read more than one story and I can draw in 3D, which means there has to be more than one dimension. And you're right, that is factually correct. But it isn't the truth. It's a fact that these are two different movies. They have different actors, locations, and themes. But the truth is that they're the same story. But it's impossible to see this if you're programmed to focus on facts. This is why truth can't be taught, only discovered. These aren't different things. They're varying degrees of the same thing. Facts are just a measurement in time. They're a snapshot that is sometimes correct, but isn't always true. Kind of like how a broken clock is right twice a day. This is why all facts have a shelf life. Anything born in time has an end in time. This is one of the secrets as to why we factor algebraic equations to zero. Facts turn you outward, while truth turns you inward. Put another way, you learn facts, you unlearn truth. Why? Because truth is always simple. This is why Occam's razor exists, and why we say you only truly understand something if you can explain it to a child. Because nothing complicated is true. Complexity and division are always a misunderstanding. That's why religious people don't understand when Christ said he was in his Father and that we are in him. Separation can never understand union. Two isn't an addition to one, it's a subtraction. Division always keeps us from truth. 
parents. Diving into this quote for a year with your children trumps a lifetime of school. As difficult as this information is to digest, there's a part of you that instinctively knows it to be true, and it's the part that enjoys movies and books. The second half of a story is always a reversal of the first. This is the fall and restoration of paradise. Plotinus called this the procession and return. The procession is our programming, where we learn our place in the world. We call this the social self. The return is when we lose our programming and focus on what really matters, restoring childlike innocence. This is our authentic self. It's why Christ said only children can see the kingdom of heaven. We must unlearn all we have learned. We're all taught about Pavlov's dogs, but we ignore the entire point of his life's work, that the human mind can be reset, resulting in a total loss of all prior conditioning. This reboot is like returning to the nakedness of Adam and restores our child mind so we can adopt new ideas that we previously opposed. One direction moves us toward matter and facts, while the other into non-matter and truth. Put another way, the first half is a discovery of where we are in the world, and the second half is the rediscovery of where we aren't. The turnaround is called the cave, and it takes place near the middle of every story. It's where Luke fights Vader and discovers his true self. This cave is school, the place our programming is removed. But when this event is moved to childhood, it leaves a gap that we now know as the midlife crisis. Whoever controls the language controls the argument, and the same is true of curriculum. Parents often ask my opinion on which educational program they should pursue for their children, and there are certainly some better than others. But it's far more important to ask why a particular style exists. How does it judge success? Does graduation require a miniature copy of the teacher, or is it when the student can think for themselves? But in the end, we all know it doesn't matter. Today, you can receive an honorary doctorate simply for having the correct worldview. And there were more graduates in 2020 than in 2021 because everyone automatically advanced to the next grade, regardless of their standings. When you give something away for free, what you're actually doing is declaring it doesn't have any value. I hope I empower my kids enough that they feel like they can do anything they want in life, as long as it doesn't infringe on someone else's sovereignty. But the truth is, if they go to university, a part of me is going to feel like a failure as a parent. There's only one story. There's only one person in that story. And that person is you. <laughs>